Greetings, Cleveland, and welcome to Creative Focus, the show that illuminates some of Cleveland's most talented and creative artists across the genres of film, dance, music, theater, and visual arts. I'm your host, Cornell Calhoun III, and I'm thrilled to have on my show today, actor Lewis Finney. Lou, welcome to Creative Focus, man. Let's chop it up. Thank you, Cal, and let's get it going. <laughs> so, we met maybe, I don't want to date myself, but maybe 30 years ago in the old, old downtown Y, playing basketball from 11 to about one o'clock. And we called you the rainmaker because you used to take that high arching shot. <laughs> Remember that those days? Oh, Tom Patton, the senator, uh, Bobby Mann. So we had a, a list of characters, the fruit man, the soup man. You remember that? What you remember about those times? I remember uh, in those times how we would have a good time between 11 o'clock and one o'clock. And the, one of the main things was the talent that was there at the Y, which was absolutely amazing. And it gave you a chance to see where your skill level was at because everybody was at such a high skill level. Yeah, yeah, we had some, we had some superstar players like Randy, Randy White, Big G. So that's how we met. And then the next thing I know, you were in the plays, my plays. So talk about how did all that come to be? Well, it came from playing basketball between 11 and one. <laughs> and I went to one of your plays on a Sunday. Oh, I think you were Blue Hill, if I can remember. Mm -hmm. It was in the black box over on uh, St. Clair. And when I saw the show and the actors and the actress, I said, wow, this is really nice. And I mentioned to you the next time we played ball, I said, you know, I wouldn't mind doing something like that. So a little while later, I believe I had went out of town on vacation and came back. There was a voice message on my telephone and then I maybe saw Art or a couple other Y members who told me that you were looking for me. So you set up a meeting for me at the Y. I came to the Y and you actually put a script in front of me and the show was from Cancer to Broadway. And I played Denise Richmond's ex-husband. And when you gave me the script, I told you at the time, that I don't know anything about this. <laughs> and you said, don't worry about it, you'll fit the part. <laughs> and that's how I got started. Yeah, that, you know, most of that I don't even remember. I just remember, you know, getting you to, to perform. And then I think from there, we did a lot of rec plays with the kids, uh, the Christmas play, the annual Christmas play in the little theater right in this building. And then we also worked with Dr. Henry Young at Tri-C, we did a lot of sustainability plays. Well, what did you uh, get from that experience working at Tri-C? Because Tri-C collaborated with the city of Cleveland and we will put on a sustainability play every April um, Earth Month uh, with Tri-C. You remember those times? Yes, I do. I remember those times very well. It was very pleasing and exciting to interact with the students who took the sustainability serious and they took their performance serious. And so it gave me the opportunity to come in to interact with younger people who actually really took the time to pay attention to everything that we were trying to show them. And we put on some great shows. Yeah, we did. We put on some fabulous shows. I think the last show we did was uh, uh, The Green Book. And that we used the theme of uh, uh, Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones. That, was, that was really exciting. So what do you enjoy most about performing? I enjoy the process of the rehearsals, the interaction with the other actors, the directions that I receive from the director to see if I'm able to actually make the character become who they want it to be, and then to go on stage and actually do the performance and see the reaction from the audience is really beautiful. Is there anything that you do before you take the stage? I mean, everybody has uh, a little quick that they do you know, before they hit the stage. Like for example, me, I always say a prayer and wonder why I even did the performance. I'm, I'm so nervous, but is there anything that you do before you hit the stage? Yes, I do it every time. And before I go up into a scene, I go over the scene on my script to make sure that I have it as complete as I possibly can. 
And then I may have a rhyme or something, a song in my head before I go out there that I'll use for a trigger. And then I'll use that trigger after going over the my lines and go out on the stage. Okay, do you have a process for learning lines? I mean, everybody has a, a process. Um, some people use a recorder. Some people just uh, go from their first line to the last line in the play. Do you have a process uh, to help you learn your lines? Uh, yes, I do. I learned the process from you. Go over your lines, go over your lines. And then sometimes you could use the recorder to hear if you sound the way that you want to sound, if you're smooth enough, uh, is your character okay? But the process is to go over your lines. And also when you do a character, that character becomes a part of you. And so sometimes the lines and actually the play or when we do our short films are things that we can say when we're out in public. The line will fit into a situation that you wouldn't even be aware of. And so I use my lines anywhere, anytime that I can. And basically all of the characters I've ever played, they're all a part of me and I can bring them out. <laughs> so... Do you watch a lot of plays? Do you watch a lot of uh, movies? Yes. Okay, so who are some of the uh, actors that you admire? I admire all actors. I think that anyone who can take and go out on the stage or go on the movie set to perform, regardless of the talent level, because talent can be brought up by good directions and good action. And so anyone and everyone, regardless if you're on a cruise ship, if you're on a out on vacation and the people are putting on a show on an island, for a person to go out there and perform, I think it's amazing. And the way the reason I feel that way is when you gave me the script and I knew nothing about acting, nothing about the script or performing, and I started off from scratch and I am not the best person. And anyone who's willing to take that up and step on the stage, even if they freeze up and don't say a word, I admire that person for the courage. Well spoken. Do you have a favorite play? Um, if not a favorite, do you have a play that really resonates with you? For me, um, years ago, I think uh, 2012, I went to the Cleveland Playhouse to see The Whipping Man and it's a three character play that just um, phenomenally just put me in a uh, unbelievable mood, not only to perform, but to, to, to write. And I remember, and I've spoke about this a couple of times on, on Creative Focus, when the play was over, 500 people just stood as one to give the actors applause. And you could see how that affected, affected, excuse me, the actors. I mean, they were just like riveted. Um, so is there a play that you witnessed that did um, something like that to you? Uh, yes, I saw Chicago in New York City on Broadway and Brittany was one of the lead characters. And the acting was amazing. The characters were amazing, and I was not fully aware of what Chicago was actually about. And in what you just described was after the show was over with, as we were standing outside, and they had a, it was a line of people that waited for the actors to come out. And the funny part is when you see the actor on the stage, they're in costume. When they come out, they might be just wearing regular clothes like us, and if you don't know them, you wouldn't know them. And to see all of the people lined up and to see the courtesy that all of the actors had that came out, took the time to sign people's playbills, to acknowledge the audience, I thought that was great. It, it gave me inspiration. Yeah, that, that, that's fascinating. That's a fascinating story to hear. So we're going to take a look at Lou Finney in the award-winning play Sugar Bell. Let's take a look. Well, now, I may need you and that little sassy gal, word to Cain, since so many of your slave brethren done run off to join the war. They run and join the war looking for their freedom. 
thinking they're right. Right. They ain't got no rights. And you ain't got none neither. When the war is over, you and your brethren will still be slaves. And you? A slave with privileges. Unlike you and that fugitive slave son of yours. Soon you won't be able to spit on your own kind. The Confederates will win. We gonna reclaim the South. Well, he tells, say, General Grant and the Union Army making headway. Hmm. Had it not been for old age, I would have run off and joined them. Run off? And been killed. I have no fear. I live under God's roof. Well, you seen them yet? Because I got orders to shoot that fugitive slave son of yours, shoot him on sight, and hang his black carcass up over the north field for all the slaves to see. Their slaves ain't worth nothing. Well, this one is. And I take pride in collecting that $1,500 reward. Many got the same plans. Slave catchers cross the country searching. Across the Carolinas and into the backwoods. But we got him. It's been a year. All y'all been searching, you ain't got him yet. Everybody busy. Except you. You, you sitting here with some they would. Everybody else is out working the cane. It be what it be. It be three in the pit right now. With room for maybe one or two more. You on my list. You and that fugitive slave son of yours. Y'all way up at the top. Y'all gone and get inside. I won't be looking at you no more today. Get. You know, I think of all the work that you've done for me, that was your paramount performance. What do you remember about Sugar Bell? What I remember about Sugar Bell is actually playing an overseer who was very honorary and mean that had a whip. <laughs> and I remember it was the scene where I tell Moses Forhe that when the colonel comes back, I'm going to sell you and all of your relatives off. <laughs> and then it was good riddance. And then after the good riddance, I don't know if you added it or if I added it, I said in good riddance too. And also when Sugar Bell approached me, the overseer fancy pants about fooling around with her sister because she was the Colonel's mistress and thought that she had rank over the plantation because being the colonel's mistress and the way that Sugar Bell, who was Carla, approached me, I really enjoyed that scene because it was just like two regular people, man and woman, arguing with each other. Yeah, Carla Macon. Yes. And she it, played Sugar. She played Sugar Bell. And so me being the overseer, I could allow her to conduct herself any kind of way and then in the end, shut him down and let her know, I'm the boss, the colonel is not here. <laughs> My favorite line uh, of Fancy Pants in that play was, I got a new pair of blue pants. I'ma wear them tomorrow. That was my fake favorite line in that play. So are there actors that you enjoy working with? Um, actors that, you know, when you find out that they're part of a production or part of the film, you get excited, you get hyped about working with them? I get hyped about working with everyone. It's an honor and a privilege to be able 
to interact with other actors and to to create a to create a vision for the audience. And so you can go into any situation, whatever it is, with any type of uh, negative negativity. So you have to be open enough to deal with everybody because everybody is not the same. So you have to interact your personality with theirs in order to make the production be positive. If you had a, a dream character to play, um, who would he be? What kind of character would he be? My dream character may sound odd and unusual. <laughs> My dream character would be to play the blind man in John chapter nine of the Bible. Why? Because of the message and the humor in it and how you can take what goes on in that, in that chapter and there's so much that you could do with his character. I would like to take that character and bring him up into a contemporary form just to get the message out, which I think is beautiful. Do you believe growing up in Cleveland influenced um, you as a performer, and if so, how? Well, growing up in Cleveland, uh, from the time I was born until nine years old, I lived on 69th between Cedar and Central. When I was nine years old, we moved southeast off 131st of Miles. We actually helped to integrate the neighborhood at the time, we were the first minority family on our block. So therefore I interacted with a completely different group of people that did not even look like myself. Then when I went to junior high school, I went to Robert H. Jameson, which brought me back into the environment I had left when I was on Cedar. And from there I transitioned to John Adams High School. After that, when I started working for the RTA, I was able to travel all around the county within all of the different neighborhoods between driving the bus and doing other positions at RTA. And so therefore I got to meet Cleveland and all of the different people without being having a biased opinion. I actually went through pretty much every community within the county that you could think of. Yeah, I asked you that because, you know, I grew up on Cedar and Central and, um, attended East Tech High School, played basketball during the time when East Tech was a powerhouse. And obviously that influenced my work and my line of thinking and the things that we had to deal with during that, during that time. Um, so that's why I smiled when you said uh, Central, Central Avenue. And, and speaking of Central Avenue, let's take a clip of Lou Finney in the award-winning play Central's lyrics. How that fine young thing of you? She is fine. Seen her getting off that CTS. Her walking up Central Avenue had three or four fellas giddy and grinning like chess cats at the way she walked on those pretty legs. You know, I learned to stay away from a pretty woman like that. Pretty woman like that keep a man confused all the time. Sweet bread ain't confused. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> Look at here. Now all I need is a good number. Now that's every now and then to keep some money in my slides. 10 to 20 shark skin suits and eight or nine pairs of Stacey Adams shoes. And you see that yellow drop top out there. Now if I want a woman, I call a woman. I give her my terms. She don't like the terms, I give her a choice. I move on to the next one. Cause you better believe, just like biscuits go with butter. <laughs> God, God knows there will be another. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. Well, you painted your picture. <laughs> Life painted it for me. You see, a woman is like a sign. Some signs is good and some signs is bad. Now some signs that look good is bad, some signs that look bad is good. So how are you gonna know? It's easier picking a good number than it is a good woman. You know, I, I heard sweet, uh, what, what's his name? Uh, Roscoe. Roscoe, yeah. yeah. He ain't hit no 584. Hit it for 1500 in the big buy. 1500? That's a lot of money. You know what you could do with 1500? 
Now, I didn't get to where I could change my clothes every day. The 624 fell in a new stock. Now, that was years ago. Now, 821 and 773 landed me that pad up there on the Gold Coast. And 432 and 362 put me in that yellow drop top out there. You see, numbers put me back on top of the world. And numbers give poor black folks a chance. Chance of the dream. You may not hit the day, but you might hit tomorrow. Amen. You just got to find your niche. Numbers is mine. Okay, Lou. So what do you remember about Central's lyrics? And that's my baby now, so you got to come with some. Central's lyrics. That's brand new, right? Yep. Brand new. What I liked about Central's lyrics and playing the character of brand new, he was flexible. Brand new was the number man, but then brand new also thought he was a lover. And brand new also thought that he had a good conversation where he could say anything that he wanted. Plus he was possessed with doing his numbers and he was very good at it. And that was what I liked about him, the flexibility and the interaction with the characters because I thought that the character that Ashley played was actually did not like me as a character in general. Ashley Wheaton. Yes. And so I remember. Ashley Aquila, I should say. Yes. And I remember the one day I asked you about my character because her line was, I believe it was, that daggone number man. And I said, well, does she have something against me? And you explained it to me. You said, no, that actually that was just a saying about the number man. It didn't have anything to do with me personally. And actually we kind of liked each other. So that was able to help me to fit my character into that role and in interacting with her. So what do you think was the biggest challenge in playing brand new? Because, you know, I grew up in uh, an environment of illegal numbers. Um, and I mean, it, it was a different way of life. And it was how a lot of black people got extra income. Uh, a lot of people didn't were unemployed and they live primarily um, through the numbers. So what was the biggest challenge you think in playing brand new? Well, I enjoy playing brand new so much. The challenge was for me to make sure he was a good character. I really enjoyed it. Um, plus it also fit into, it fit into my own personal character. I, you know, I played the number man and all of these other kind of people before. So I was familiar with the character and I liked the role. And for some reason, it seems like people like me in that role, so. Was... Yeah, because you actually played the numbers man in um, The Hollow Image. Yes. And in the film um, Unthinkable. Right, so. So you got a history of playing. Right, so I got a history of being a number man. So, <laughs> and so as a matter of fact, maybe I need to start writing numbers. <laughs> so, you know, you've been in so many award-winning films. So here we are. Uh, Paradise, Vance, Ice Cold, Lemonade. Do you have a preference, uh, film or theater? I like them both. The thing that I enjoy about what we do and the challenges that we face in doing it is we don't get a second shot. If we're on the stage, we got one shot. When we film it, we have one shot. You know, we don't go back and cut. We don't correct things on the way. And everybody has to know their part and do their part in order to make the production to be successful. Why do you think um, so many of those films um, did so well, won so many awards? First, I would say our scripts are excellent. We have excellent scripts. We have excellent direction. Uh, we have people that are dedicated to the task of doing it. We show up, we do our work, we leave our personalities at the door because you know, sometimes a director becomes another character when they're the director. <laughs> You're my friend when we're just talking casually, but when it comes to direction, sit down, shut up and do what I say. And so you have to be able to be humble enough in order to take instructions from the director in order to do the performance and make the production successful. 
Do you have a preference, film or theater? No. You enjoy both? I enjoy both. It's the opportunity to perform because with each performance, it gives you a chance to improve your skills in the craft. Okay, so we've watched Lewis Finney in uh, the theater. Now we're gonna take a look at Lewis in the film industry, in the award-winning film, Vans Ice Cold Lemonade. Let's take a look. Good morning, girls. Good morning. Well, I'll have an ice cold lemonade, please. That will be one dollar, Father. And that will be my pleasure. What do you remember most about that film, that short film? What I remember about Van's ice cold lemonade was it was during the 24-hour film festival. 48 hours. With a 48-hour film festival. And we kind of had our times so with maybe a little bit mixed up. And I remember I was at home and you gave me a call. And I'm like, oh, I got to get down there. So it was blazing hot that day. It seemed like it was 100 degrees and we were over by the free press. Free stamp. The yeah. free stamp. Mm -hmm. And for me, I had on the pre-shirt, which was long sleeve. It's burning up hot. I'm sweating like Patrick Ewing in the fourth quarter, and I don't have any hair. So sweat is just running down my face. But uh, it was uh, really fun to do it with the kids. And uh, as we can see, it was a good performance because we've won so many awards. What motivates you as a performer, Lou? To please the audience. That's my goal, to please the audience. And what's the difference in terms of you as an actor in a film and you as an actor on stage? What's the biggest challenge you think you face? When we're doing film, it's not like the movies and things we see on television. Film for us, because maybe a budget crisis or whatever, we have to do it on the spot and do it right, just like we're on the stage. There's no cut, no retake. Nothing like that. So we have to do it right. And that's why I think and feel that actors that can do it like that are just as talented as actors who we see on screen and on the big stages. I think it's opportunity that's the most, is the biggest thing. Okay, so you've been in so many films, so many plays. Name one of your most memorable performances, a time when you think you nailed it, when uh, you walked out of the theater or you walked off the set with swag. And don't tell me everyone. No, I'm not, I'm gonna, I did a show down at Kent State that was called Brokeology. My character was William King. There was a theme that month with Alzheimer's and dementia. So I was a father, a widow, with two sons. I had dementia and was also diabetic at the time. So we did at least four shows. So the young men that were I was acting with, before one of the shows, they came up to me and they said, look, we know what he told you to do, but we want you to do it this way because they wanted to capture the audience. And so I said, okay. So there's a scene where I describe, I was on a boat on a sunny day with my wife and my son. And everything was beautiful. She had beautiful dress, the sky is blue, water's calm. And the boat sprang a leak. And when the boat sprang a leak, I had to make a choice. And this choice was in a dream. So the choice was I could save my wife or my infant son because they couldn't swim. And so they would ask me, they said, well, what happened? What happened? And I always, I don't know, I woke up. So later on, we had another scene sitting around the breakfast table. And I told them I had that dream again last night. 
They said, well, what happened? And just as previously, beautiful day boat was sinking. I had one son sitting here, the other one was sitting there. And this was the part that they wanted me to do. And so when I got, when I said, well, the boat's sinking, I had to make a choice. So they asked me, what did I do? What was the choice? And I told my youngest son, I saved you. And I told him I saved you. And then we bowed our heads and the audience bowed down. I said, I swam back out to the boat and drowned with my wife. Well, after the show, I was in the dressing room changing. And one of the cast came back and asked me to come back to the lobby of the theater. And when I went back, they wanted me, there was people that wanted me to sign their playbills. Mm. And there was a man that was standing there that wanted me to sign his playbill. And he said that he wished that he could die with his wife like I did with mine. And so it was very humbling to have people to actually want you to sign their playbills and were able to relate to what you did as a character. Yeah, that's a that's a phenomenal story. Um, you've done a lot of great work. Um, I think uh, Fancy Pants is a memorable character uh, for me that you played. But I'm gonna tell you something too. You were in a play by Vicki Williams, Even the Blind Can See. That was one of the first times that you worked uh, with me and you played an older uh, prisoner. And, you know, after that show, I said, you know, Lou Finney got some talent. <laughs> I said, Lou Finney got some talent. Even the blind can see about a man who was incarcerated, I think for 13 years um, and, and, and wrongly, wrongly accused. So what advice would you give to a, a young actor starting out? maybe one of our kids that we use in our productions. I would give the young actor the advice I learned playing handball. Handball is a game that no matter how good an athlete you are, you won't be good at it until you learn it. So you have to be humble enough to take advice, to go out and get beat, and to use what you've learned in order to develop your skills. And with younger people, they tend to, they're emotional. You know, maybe what you say to them can affect them away. And you have to, you have to encourage them and, nerd, you know, nurture them and just tell them to just stay with it and help them to control their emotions, to teach them young how to take directions because that's what life is about. Unless you're your own boss, running your own show, you're gonna have to listen and take advice and directions from other people till you get there. So what's your ultimate goal in terms of performance? Where do you wanna be in five years? In the next five years, I wanna, I wanna do, uh, I'm gonna take a class. It's one of the first things I'm going to do. I have an opportunity to uh, be mentored by somebody, and but it's a class, so I'm going to take this class. Well, what kind of class? It's a uh, acting class. Okay. And I met someone when I was in Georgia who referred me to a person that could help me, and the person is in a position where if they still there, they can help. Okay. So what's next for Lou Finney? What can we uh, see from you in the future? Well, that remains to be seen, but we're going to see something <laughs> because we got uh, coals in the fire and the pot is boiling and then we got ambitions and goals and we're getting ready to uh, start a process of getting back on stage. Okay. We were doing very well before the pandemic and the pandemic shut us all down. And before the pandemic, when I was brand new, I was actually getting to a point where I was feeling comfortable, which is not really good because you want that edge to make sure that you stay on point. And I felt at that point I was getting, I was learning the craft better, and then we got shut down for all these years. Okay, well thanks for uh, 
appearing on my show. I appreciate it. Well, well thanks for having me. I'd like to thank my special guest, Louis Finney, for hanging out with us today on Creative Focus. So that's it, Cleveland. We're out. But remember, a true artist is not only inspired, but inspires others. I'm Cornell Calhoun for TV20 and Creative Focus. Until the next time becomes our time, be well, be safe.